so it, it, it's good to be here. I haven't been here for the conference, so I see some, uh, some friends, and uh, I'm sure there are others uh, who I don't know uh, here in the audience. So I, I want to just uh, discuss in the, in the 25 minutes that I've been allocated. Um, some of the things that led me to write a book called The Good Doctor, you might be wondering what I've been doing since I was decommissioned. Uh, and, uh, and, and I spent a year um, with a grant from the New Zealand Law Foundation uh, writing a book, and for Bev's benefit and for the benefit of the uh, nurses that we have with us, I've also slightly expanded my brief uh, today. But, but this is a session on, on safe health care. I know there's been a lot of emphasis on that today and indeed at the meeting that preceded this. Um, so I want to just, I've got the wrong pointer, this is the one. Just a couple of slides that people will have seen, some will have seen before. Uh, Lindley Lake uh, from the Capiti uh, region, who died after she was prescribed a beta blocker uh, uh, following a failure when she transferred to the practice to take a good history, which would have elicited the information of her asthma condition. But I've highlighted there, um, I went back this morning, and I've just highlighted the, the quote that came from one of the, uh, the doctors in the practice. We've moved on a bit from some of those days. And I want to just acknowledge also the, um, I'm pressing, there we are, something that I am very aware of, and that is that when a patient of yours dies, that it has a lingering impact for you. And this was a quote from a uh, general practitioner in Tikuiti, uh, whom I met personally. And he felt pretty awful about the whole thing, even though he was completely exonerated for his care um, of a 17-year-old of a Māori boy with meningococcal septicemia. So very much the focus of, of, I know, your conference, but certainly my work in the 10 years uh, as commissioner was looking at systems of care rather than individuals. Uh, and in New Zealand, the, uh, the code of patients' rights is ubiquitous. So, uh, you know, there, there wouldn't be a uh, there wouldn't be a medical centre or a health centre or a hospital uh, or a rest home where you don't see the uh, the code hanging. Uh, and I had the privilege of, of, of helping advise on the uh, on the wording of it. Now, the, these these patients are in fact HDC staff, former colleagues, pretending to be patients in an Albert Street medical centre, with the permission, of course, of the practice uh, manager. So, I don't need any convincing about the importance of systems and just for a little light relief there are some things worse than swine flu this on the day that my north shore hospital inquiry report was released the joke is in the in the top corner of the uh, of the slide <laughs> but i want to take you back to january 2004 when i visited england to, uh, to, to, as an expert witness at the Shipman Inquiry. Now, Harold Shipman, of course, was the general practitioner who murdered, uh, well, he was found to have murdered about 14 of his patients, but in fact found to have killed over 200 of his patients. Uh, and this is a photograph taken by me on a Sunday morning, uh, a dull Sunday morning, uh, of the this outer suburb of Manchester, Hyde, and one can see in the, over there in the, in the, just in that extremity, where Harold Shipman, Fred Shipman's practice was. There was a pharmacy there and the Donnybrook Medical Centre there with uh, six uh, general practitioners working there. And, and so at that inquiry, which was actually about a doctor who was pathological. I mean, he, you know, no system in the world probably would have detected him, and he was certainly highly competent. One of his, uh, one of the sons of one of his patients, one of the patients that he killed, said, Harold Shipman was a very good doctor. I will always remember the care he gave to my father, the home visits he made. The only thing was he killed my father. So he was guideline compliant. He was evidence-based in his practice when he wasn't killing his uh, when he wasn't killing his patients. Of course, ultimately he killed himself. And, and uh, on the eve of my departure for the inquiry, the Sunday Star Times uh, carried mugshots of of, uh, of Shipman and uh, 
Patterson and said, Commissioner travels to England for inquiry, shipman suicides. <laughs> <laughs> but at that inquiry, Dame Janet Smith posed the question to the General Medical Council and to each of us who gave evidence, what systems do you have to ensure the competence of medical practitioners? And you know, there I was, the Health and Disability Commissioner of New Zealand, and at the break I was sitting on the internet going back and looking at the Medical Council website. And I became intrigued because in her report, which really was supposed to be about something else, she honed in on this question of revalidation and effectively said that what the General Medical Council had been planning then for five years was not good enough and that they needed something more rigorous. But of course, when I came back and looked at what we were doing in New Zealand, it became clear to me that in fact we were not uh, proactively checking, that we were simply relying on CPD. And indeed, I was certainly aware that reactively, the regulator, the Medical Council, was often slow uh, and somewhat timorous in its responses. So, I'm having a little fun playing with all these things. I keep on lifting one up, nothing happens. There we are. This question of, of the good doctor, William Osler, and I, you've been hearing a lot this morning, I understand, about the importance of listening to patients. And he, of course, as the father, many would say, of modern medicine, uh, reminded us of, of the importance of that. But in 1885, he was in his mid-30s. He was about to move from Montreal. He's a Canadian. He was moving from uh, McGill University to the University of uh, Pennsylvania. He had not yet founded um, Johns Hopkins. And then, of course, he went on to be the Regis Chair of Medicine at, at Oxford. But in 1885, he wrote an article in the Canadian Journal of Medi Medicine and Surgery in which he said, in a well-ordered society, a well-arranged society, a man should feel that he can command at any time the services of a doctor trained in the art and science of medicine, into whose hands he may commit with safety the lives of those near and dear to him. This notion of into whose hands he may commit with safety the lives of those near and dear to him. It's 127 years later, but I don't believe we've yet realised that aspiration of Osler's. So in the brief time remaining, Here's a roadmap. It's always good to remember the people of Canterbury. Just briefly, some observations on competence, uh, on professionalism, on problem practitioners, and on, and then my prescription for change. So, starting with competence. Now, now the the educationalists draw a distinction between knowing what to do, competence in that narrow sense, and performance, actually doing it in practice. But of course, the public doesn't think think that way. They expect you to know what to do and to actually do it. And interestingly, in a little study that was done down in Dunedin in 2009, they surveyed 189 patients in pharmacies, but they were asking the patients in the pharmacy settings about their expectations of a good doctor. And number one was said to be competence, that they knew what to do, uh, that, they had made, that they had the skills and the knowledge. Uh, that we look for in a doctor. There's a little book written at, uh, in the 1600s, 1684, called Medicus Pecans, The Sinning Doctor. I think I would have enjoyed that as HDC. Um, and the first mortal sin of a doctor was said to be to practice medicine without being thoroughly skilled in the art. And the good doctor was said to be verbonus, the good man, they were men, Good verbonus medicinae peritus, skilled in medicine. The good man skilled in medicine. But of course, that's only part of the occasion because patients also look for those humanistic qualities, care and compassion, which I know you've heard quite a bit about over the last two days. Uh, and in 2002, the British Medical Journal had an online debate in which doctors were asked what they look for in a good doctor. And interestingly, doctors themselves rated those humanistic qualities ahead of technical, technical competence, which perhaps they took for granted. So we capture this in the, in the famous painting of, can the IT people tell me how I can do a better job of this? Because every time I push, it doesn't happen. Anybody give me a? 
now it works. So there, of course, we have Sir Luke Fields' 1891 commission painting of the, of the Doctor, in which he remembers his son, Philip, who had died in, in, uh, as a child, and the, the Doctor who came and watched over his son. And so we see the, the caring Doctor, we, we hope also the competent physician, watching over the sick child with the, uh, with the, with the uh, parents hovering in the background. Uh, and I found this, this slide as well, uh, which I kind of like. So here we see the, uh, the good nurse, Sarah Wills, I believe it is, from, uh, from the Wellington area. And, and who knows who that is, having his flu vaccination? John Schuster, the former All Black. So we look for practitioners who are competent, but who are also caring in their, uh, in, in their manner. But that's not always what we find. Oh, I'm jumping ahead. We also look for professionalism. Elliot Friedson describes a profession as having three attributes. First, the special skills and competencies. And of course, one can look for those in a plumber and a mechanic and a gas fitter as well. But we look for special skills and competencies. But what is said to make medicine and law and engineering uh, true professions in the priesthood, in being, you know, being, being a priest, is that that is in the service of the public. And the third element is that in return for that, society grants the right to regulate the profession to that group. So that is, that is the notion of profession, of the profession. And, and professionalism uh, is sort of proclaimed by members of the profession. And we saw this very clearly in New Zealand in 2001, when the American Board of Internal Medicine and the various uh, European colleges of physicians, including the Royal College of Physicians, proclaimed a new charter of medical professionalism for the new millennium. And when I saw the way in which the ASMS and the NCMA leapt upon this new, uh, this, this, this new charter, and when I heard the way in which it was used in New Zealand in this rather odd context, as if it was something that somehow to do with anti-managerialism, I, I, I at times wondered if they'd actually gone back and read the source document. Because the source document said in principle one that the first principle of, this, of a professional, of a medical professional, is maintenance of one's skills. And the statement is made that the profession as a whole should strive to ensure that all its members remain competent, striving to ensure. That is the guarantee that is extended to the public. But sadly, sometimes all professions let the public down. And uh, David Blumenthal, the Harvard professor of medicine, said to me on one occasion that professionalism can easily become a refuge of scoundrels. You know, we can sort of, we can circle the wagons and say, well, we, we leave this to the profession to deal with. And of course, that's no longer regarded as acceptable by the public. You know, professionalism isn't actually a term that resonates, especially with the public. The pu to them, it has connotations, I believe, to many people, of, of a club, uh, of, of a sort of, some sort of club. And so I think we may need to, to rethink our, our language in, uh, in this area. But part of professionalism is the right to self-regulate. And that, of course, has been uh, nibbled away at in many countries, and classically in New Zealand. With the Cartwright Inquiry in 1988-1989, and the co-regulatory model that we set up with an independent commissioner co-regulating with the various professional bodies, the Nursing Council and the Medical Council, and, and so forth, how Cartwright change at all. And similarly, Bristol, uh, the Bristol Inquiry in the United Kingdom and Chelmsford in Australia, many other inquiries, have had, and, and more recently the Queensland Com Commission of Inquiry, have had similar uh, impacts in, in changing the, the, the bargain. So because when there are these failures, they actually both provoke and legitimise a response by the, uh, by the Parliament. So all of that is has, uh, has come to pass. Problem practitioners. We haven't got a lot of time, so I, we, we won't spend too much time talking about problem practitioners, but they exist in every profession. And obviously, there are, you know, there are the, the sexual predators, like general practitioner Morgan Fahey, but they are one in thousands and thousands and thousands, the criminals. 
There are, of course, the doctor or the nurse with um, drug addiction problems who may end up stealing medication, who may end up even using patients uh, as means to an end, and, we, and we've certainly seen cases uh, of that. More often what we see are cases of, of poor communication and sometimes, frankly, treating patients not just with discourtesy, but with callousness. But we also see situations where patients are harmed sometimes not just by the system, but by a poorly performing <coughs> practitioner within that system. Uh, and so I think, of, I think of a case last year from the tribunal where a, uh, a nurse who'd been working at Hokianga Health, uh, a, a Keith Curry, uh, was found um, guilty of professional misconduct after he, uh, he administered Maxilon to uh, prescribe Maxilon, which wasn't in the standing orders, uh, for a a 19-year-old woman who was six or seven weeks pregnant uh, and issues raised in that case uh, about more broadly, it wasn't simply a mistake, it actually raised more fundamental questions about his understanding of medicines management but also his understanding of the need to consult with the midwife or with the, uh, with the doctor at the hospital, which he failed to do. But I want to tell you briefly about Marlene who lived within um, 20 kilometres of, of where we are right now. And I tell this story with the permission of her family. So, in, and I tell the story in my book. So in 2002, uh, Marlene was 62 and she presented to her uh, general practitioner, though in fact he was not vocationally registered, but she would have called him her GP. She'd been to him for 20 years and she turned up to see him and she complained of dysuria and of abdominal symptoms, tenderness front and back over the ki kidneys. And she saw him five more times uh, over the next five months. And, and, and by the end of that period, during which the, um, the doctor had taken very, very poor notes, had not undertaken the most basic uh, investigations, finally a CT scan was ordered uh, and, and it revealed the, the tumour of, of her uterus from which she died two months later, from which she may in any event, of course, ha ha have died. But the family, her sister and her niece, made a, a complaint. What was the situation of the doctor, who I did not name, we, we were calling Dr. B. He was in his mid-70s. It was 50 years since he had got uh, his degree and been admitted to the medical register. He didn't know how to use the computer. He did, hadn't found it necessary to, to, uh, to do that. He was now really in a part-time job. He wasn't a partner there. He had, had his own practice. He'd come in. He was known and liked by the... Uh, the doctors at the practice, and he just worked a couple of days a week. Now, they must have been seeing, that they were seeing his patients from time to time when they present on the other days of the week, and they saw the quality of his notes. But when, in the course of the investigation, I said to them, well, what was your role in oversight of this doctor? They, they said in response, we are not our brother's keepers. That is not our responsibility. That is the job of the medical council. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't complain when the medical council comes onto your patch or the nursing council wants to see how you're practicing and wants evidence of the way in which you've maintained your competencies. The family said to me, she trusted her doctor. She'd been seeing him for 20 years. She believed he was a professional. So what do we know about this problem of problem practitioners? Well, at least in respect of doctors, the evidence is not as strong as it would be because frankly, we don't go in and do the assessments that might tell us. But most regulators internationally agree that up to 1 in 20, 5% uh, of doctors practice below an appropriate standard. And in one in-depth study in Ontario, we suggested that 1.5% are actually you know, dangerous for patients, pose a, a real risk to patients, should not be practicing tomorrow. And if you extrapolate those, those figures in New Zealand's practice population of, of uh, 14,000, that might be a couple of hundred. Now, now there are other really important things to, to worry about in the health system. This, I do not suggest, is the only problem in the system. It's just that it's something that intrigued me and that for me was something I wanted to delve into a little bit more. How are we checking that people maintain, maintain their competencies? So, uh, if we look then at the, what I call the prescription for change, you see in New Zealand we got very excited because in 2000 and we passed a new piece of legislation called the Health Practitioner's Competence Assurance Act. And it's a very fine piece of legislation. 
And one would have thought those words mean something. Parliament was sending a, clean, a clear signal. Competence assurance that the public can be assured and indeed the, reg the regulator, the nursing council, the medical council is not supposed to issue the APC unless it has evidence that you remain competent and fit to practice. But in fact, of course, we rely on CPD programs which are surrogates for competence. And people put a lot of good effort, you know, a lot of hard work into, into undertaking these activities. And of course, they include going to conferences like this and doing your CME and a clinical audit and peer review, all in and of themselves valuable activities. Largely, however, relying on passive learning. And as Ian St. George says, they don't actually ensure competence. They were never set up to do so. Just a little, a, a brief joke on, uh, in, in relation, on in my own experience in relation to CPD. I sit these days as a community board member for the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. And in May we had a board meeting, uh, trying to upskill us, so we did governance training for a day, but the range as I'd already, already, done, already done a week-long course. And I just decided I needed to go to the library and mark my health law essays for the University of Auckland. When I came back to my desk the next day, I found this statement of attendance, and I discovered that I had earned seven CPD hours. <laughs> now, of course, I would never claim them in any event. I'm not a, uh, not a doctor, but you can sort of get my drift. So I argue in my book that we need some new medicine. I've put up here a slide of some old medicine. So, so what do I actually argue for? Um, and I, I don't want to suggest that you don't need to go and buy the book and read it for yourself. I argue, amongst other things, for a reform for our, our regulators, um, and they've taken me at my word there, so I'm, I'm, I'm now chairing the independent steering group of the 16 uh, responsible registration authorities, looking uh, at how we might work together to do a better job of, of, of regulatory functions. But I also believe that it's time to look at the best of what's happening in the UK and in Canada and the United States in terms of better ways of assuring the competence of practitioners. Uh, and that includes, firstly, multi-source feedback from patient and colleagues. They've been doing this for many years in uh, Alberta. Practitioners find it very useful. It's, it, it, and it's only if there appears to be a, a problem that you might then drill down a level and, and look to have a, a the equivalent of what we're now calling a regular practice review or a, you know, somebody actually coming in and doing an assessment in your practice. So that's part of it and that's been regarded as non-negotiable and by the General Medical Council who are rolling out revalidation this December. The second thing that I argue for is that we need to develop much better online assessment tools that you as a practitioner can go and that will be, if you're working in diabetes care as a, as a nurse, if you're working in a particular sort of practice, whether it's rural or, 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 or urban, a uh, particular subspecialty, that it will be relevant to your practice and that you have the opportunity to get feedback, to see are you an outlier, and then to retake it. So it's not a, 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 you know, an all or nothing pass and fail, but that it's relevant to your practice. And thirdly, we also need to do a better job as they do in Quebec, of screening. We can't actually afford to go and do an intensive assessment of every doctor. And of course, there's probably no need to do so, uh, because I'm sure that 95% are practicing at, at a very good standard. Uh, we just don't know which ones we are. So we're sort of, we're, we're trying to balance giving this guarantee to the public of assurance, but also quality improvement for, for all doctors. But we do need to do a better job of screening from complaints, from concerns of colleagues, from multi-source feedback, uh, from, from, from other sources such as those online tests, whether there might be an occasion to go in and take a closer look. The public thinks this is already happening. The public would be surprised to know that the profession does not already have its house in order in this way. Certainly, when surveyed in the UK, they were very promised, uh, and that is our challenge. I was going to read you a lovely poem from uh, from Glenn Cahoon, but I don't think we actually have time. So I, I, I just wanted to... I have time. Oh, wonderful. Then I will... I'm going, this will only take me two minutes. So it's actually, it's actually relevant to, uh, to the point that I've been making about surety, and you, you will in a moment see why. So in playing God, there's a lovely poem by Glenn Cahoon, uh, Dr. Poet, and, and I read it with his permission, a brief format to be used when consulting with patients. 
The patient will talk, the doctor will talk. The doctor will listen while the patient is talking. The patient will listen while the doctor is talking. The patient will think that the doctor knows what the doctor is talking about. The doctor will think that the patient knows what the patient is talking about. The patient will think that the doctor knows what the patient is talking about. The doctor will think that the patient knows what the doctor is talking about. The doctor will be sure, the patient will be sure. At the very end of my book, I go on to say that achieving justified assurance for patients and the public will not come easily. And we've seen this already with the rollout of regular practice review for general registrants, who are, of course, overrepresented in cases where competence concerns come to light. It's taken a decade of birthing pains in the United Kingdom. This is not going to be easy. The question is whether or not we believe that, it, it, that we have an obligation to, to the public. Because if one in 20 doctors are not practicing at that standard, the problem is we don't know which doctor that is. And Sir Liam Donaldson in his report uh, in 2004 or five, Good Doctors Safer Patients, said in the opening there, most doctors know of a doctor whom, on balance, they would prefer not to treat themselves or a family member. And of course, that does not meet William Osler's aspiration. And on another occasion, when I was at a meeting with Liam Donaldson, uh, a Californian, oh, there, was, there was a sort of a discussion of, well, how will we know in relation to this issue when we've reached the promised land? And the response that came from a Californian physician was when doctors are willing to, to accept random allocation of a doctor for their own or their family's medical care. <laughs> Thank you all.